What is up guys? Welcome back to another Revit video. In this Revit video, we're going to look at stair railing codes. That is very specific, I know, but we've looked at a ton of different things when it comes to stairs. So check out the playlist that's on stairs. We, we look at all the modeling. We even previously looked at the stair codes themselves. So I would check that out before you watch this, because this is just about the railings. Although important, it is just about railings and not the stair itself. So if at any point in this video you happen to learn something, please demolish that like button. It really, really helps me out a lot. Okay, getting into it now. We're going to look at the actual just the rails the codes for rails and we're again we're going to use ibc 2018 because a ton of municipalities have not yet adopted 2021 and so this is going to be relevant for many years to come of course but also if you are not using 2018 i would highly recommend you take this and then also compare it to the specific project and location and their particular version of ibc 2021 if you need to so it should carry through mostly, but uh, definitely worth doing your due diligence for sure. And also just know we're talking about commercial stairs in general and probably uh, primarily those that are egress stairs, not like convenience stairs or things like that. So looking at this first bullet, we've got handrails must be located on both sides of a stair. So what does that really mean? Well, that means that obviously we need to have handrails on both sides of the stair. And I will say we are talking about egress stairs for one, but also primarily within commercial buildings. So uh, just be aware of that as we go through all of this. Um, but the main thing here is that we need 30 inches or less from a handrail, like the distance between you and a handrail needs to be 30 inches or less. And so we've got a diagram here, which is going to be a clipping from this particular code. And this is going to say here, intermediate handrails, Stairways shall have intermediate handrails located in such a manner that all portions of the stairway minimum width or required capacity are within 30 inches. So basically, are you within 30 inches of a handrail? Okay, that says nothing about, you know, your stair width or anything like that, just that you have to be within 30 inches. So here's a second diagram that will make things a little bit more clear because it will tell you, depending on the width of your stair, where you might need a handrail. So most of the time, I'm not doing a giant, giant high rise building, but there are some instances where you might have the required stair width over 60 inches. Therefore, you would need to have an intermediate handrail centered on that stair run because you would need to have everyone who's attempting to egress be within 30 inches of a handrail. So that's going to be required at that point. So generally speaking, we're going to be at 60 inches or less for any sort of basic egress stair, which means we just have a handrail that is on each side. Very easy. That's just typical. Okay. So then handrail shall be continuous to the handrail of an adjacent stair flight. Uh, what does that really mean? Well, we're talking about primarily switchback stairs, obviously for egress purposes, going from level to level, they're just going to wind down and you'll have to have that center handrail be continuous between them. Now, this doesn't necessarily always apply to switchbacks because you might have a stair that ends up L in one direction or just angles off into another direction. And if that's the case, then you can keep that handrail continuous. So here's a basic diagram of this. And we're going to end up coming back to this diagram because there's a lot here. Uh, so we can see that this center portion of handrail is continuous because we're just running around in circles around switchback stairs. Very, very simple. Okay. So then we can see that moving on down, the handrail shall return to a wall or a guardrail or walking surface with 12 inches beyond the top riser and continue with the slope at the bottom riser one tread length. So that was kind of a mouthful. So what is that saying? Well, basically you need handrail extensions on the top and the bottom of any stair run. And that applies to whenever you're getting to an intermediate landing or the bottom of the stair, which is also considered a landing or the top of the stair, which is also considered a landing. So then this diagram here will give you everything that you need to know about that. Again, the IBC sections are right here for your knowledge. We can see that beyond the top of the stair run, we extend 12 inches and then at the base, we continue that slope, and that is a length of one tread depth. And that's typically going to be our 11 inches, whatever it might be. But if this for some reason is more than that, then you would need to extend more than that as well. Alrighty. 
And then moving on down, obviously our handrail height is between 34 and 38 inches continuously. A lot of these uh, you can find in ADA as well, because you would need to compare to ADA and especially compare to ADA if you have a particular codes that override ADA for your particular state. That's very important. So the handrail height between 34 and 38 inches continuously, that is very important. And so rails cannot project more than four and a half inches. We've seen this before. Um, I will go ahead and post this here, but it's a long section basically saying uh, we have to have a, we cannot have handrails that ex extend more than four and a half inches into our stair width. If that's the case, we need to start increasing the width of our stair to account for that distance between handrails. Okay. And then here we go, the clear floor space between the handrail and the wall or other surface should not be, it should be at least an inch and a half. And uh, this is, again, another code section here it, stating that not less than one and a half inches, but we can look here at this code. Here are the acceptable profiles for type one or two, and I'm not going to explain the different types of uh, handrail profiles that are acceptable, but you'll start to see why some of these are acceptable and why they might not be. The main thing that we need to be aware of is graspability. Can you, can someone even with large hands grasp onto this? And basically we just need to maintain uh, certain circumferences and diameters and whatnot, depending on the shape. So typically what you're going to see is if you're using a basic half you know, a round handrail, you're going to be one and a half inches from a wall or any, uh, any surface, which will be this distance here. And then your diameter of that round, handrail would be probably the same, an inch and a half. And so you can see that we're only projected three inches at that point. Now, if you're projecting off a guardrail, assuming those guardrails are on the stringers, again, you're probably only projecting three -ish inches into the stair width. And so that's not an issue. You still calculate your width based on the, you know, let's call it occupiable area of stair width. And obviously as your profile changes, different things start to change. So you need to have that minimum inch and a half uh, below it as well. So you can really fully grasp that type. And we can see this is more along the lines of ADA, but still this does apply when it comes to anything. And obviously this is going to change uh, the type of profile that you're using. If you want it, that you want to do something like this, that's not specifically round or square. I, I don't know why you'd want to have a different type of rail for an egress, but that's the type of thing to be aware of. Okay, so there's one more thing I want to draw your attention to, and it is actually back to this diagram. And we can really kind of see all of this working together, which is great. So we've got our door clearance, whatever we talked about in a previous video, we have that four and, uh, four and a half inches max, and that's everywhere. Um, we obviously have our one tread minimum, and then we have our 12 inch minimum here at the top. That's very important. You have to at least go to 12 inches and that can continue back around. It can continue down to the floor. It continue to the wall, that type of thing. In this case, most of these types of stairs switch backs, it'll just continue back to the wall. And so this is important too. So these are landings, top and bottom or intermediate landings, though, however you want to look at it, every landing is a, a top or a bottom landing, that type of thing. So with, given these handrail extensions, we don't need to extend our handrail all the way around. And that's part of the problem I have with Revit is that whenever you draw a railing on there, it's just going to immediately dump the rail across the entire length of the stair, which is totally not right. It's, it's not the way we want to do it at all. And so if, for example, obviously I have the stairs with railings like I want to, but you can see this is a great example. This one in particular, I haven't edited that rail at all. And so it continued around and this does not need to exist. I don't need to have that there at all. Some other things to be aware about when it comes to modeling rails in Revit is that they're not going to come with extensions necessarily. Now, if we look at some of these, whether it's a guardrail or handrail, you have the ability uh, to add extensions. So we can use these particular rails and maybe they have an extension style here that you've built in and you can put in a particular length. I've seen that a lot of times. Um, that gets a little fishy because you might have different places you want to use that stair other, or that rail other than a stair where it would just look wrong or whatever it might be. So it, those are things to be aware of. And so I will say I don't go to the ends of the earth modeling stair rails because it can be it can be a pain and almost not worth doing. So kind of take it with a grain of salt and do what you feel like you can. Also, we looked at a, a 
another video when it came to modeling stairs that if you want to maintain a continuous handrail here and have it look a little bit better at least around the intermediate landing if you offset one tread here it helps with constructability in the real world and also in Revit so it will actually appear to be continuous just like that that type of thing it doesn't like end up going vertical and things like that but uh, just know for those intermediate conditions you are able to actually have the handrail go mostly vertical to continue that is acceptable you don't have to maintain that uh, 34 to 38 inches along with that i will say that the 34 to 38 inches uh, actually does it matters where that is measured from because that's really important uh, so looking back at this diagram right here we can see that the 34 to 38 inches uh, it's not just measured anywhere from any of the stair treads it is measured from the nosing and this applies exactly to the headroom that you need within a stair that we looked at in the previous video uh, but it is from the actual if you're looking at the top of course it's from the top there but uh, anywhere across the stair itself is going to be along the nosing and so at that point you need to maintain that 34 to 38 inches that's really easy to do so just just be aware of that so that will do it for this video we looked at all the different kind of basic level of stair railing codes and how it applies to IBC 2018. Uh, obviously, please look at your own project when it comes to these type of things. Uh, this is just a good, I hope, starting point for you to understand how and how your rail should be modeled, where they should be, the types that you should have, and all of those types of things. In future videos, we will look at the actual calculated stair with how to calculate that because that's really important. We'll also look at documentation of stairs, like themselves, egress stairs, because we need to present this knowledge that we have now in a way to where the contractor can understand how it should be constructed and so that all of our codes are maintained. Those are very important. So if you happen to learn something, please demolish that like button. It really helps me out a lot. Also consider subscribing. That does as well. And I will see you in the next video. Have a wonderful day and thank you very much for watching.